I want to begin our conversation, if we can, with a quote from John Kirby, the spokesperson for the US National Security Council. And, Minister, this is what he had to say. There's no reason for this to be seen as some sort of escalation. Nothing has changed about our policy, nothing. We still want to see a ceasefire. We still want to get hostages out. Minister, can we just begin with that line coming from the administration? What exactly do you believe has changed as they turn around and say nothing has? Well, I believe their policy that has been pretty consistent, John, since the beginning of the war about six months ago, <clears throat> was to not accept a ceasefire that would be uh, unconditional and it would have to be connected to an agreement to release hostages. Unfortunately, in this text that was passed, those two issues were separated for the first time. In fact, five days before, there was a resolution that the United States put forward that was uh, vetoed by uh, China and Russia. And one of the reasons why they vetoed it is because it connected those two issues. And if you look at the text, and everyone can go see it on the UN website, and you look at the resolution uh, five days ago, and you look at the resolution that passed yesterday, you'll see a huge difference. And unfortunately, that's a change in U.S. policy. Now, I'm glad to hear that John Kirby said it's not a change in U.S. policy, and I hope that they will continue to connect those two issues. But that's not the text of the resolution. And that's why Hamas celebrated the resolution and welcomed it. That's why Iran welcomed it. Believe me, any any resolution by the UN Security Council that Hamas welcomes is not a good resolution for Israel. Minister, you were due to travel yesterday evening. Could you share with us what you said to the administration directly after that decision? Well, I spoke to them. I haven't spoken to them after that decision. I spoke to them before that decision. When we first learned about which direction this was going, I did on, I think it was Sunday night. Uh, and when I heard what was happening, I said, look, you, you're going to have it's the wrong message at the wrong time. I explained to you why it was the wrong message, because it's not connecting the issue of a ceasefire with the return of the hostages. And why is it such bad timing? Because we had negotiators in Doha trying to get an agreement to release uh, hostages. And it's not surprising that Hamas decided to reject the latest proposal that was put forward by the Americans, because why? Why should they not reject it? They think they're going to get a ceasefire without giving up the hostages because that's what the resolution said. And I understand and I appreciate that the United States has said that's not our policy, but that's not the text of the resolution. And that's the problem. And I told them before, if this would be the case, I would find it very difficult to believe that the prime minister would send a delegation to Washington. Why? Because the purpose of us going to Washington was to discuss and to actually listen to American ideas of how we should go into Rafah, the other ideas that they said they had, without a major military operation in Rafah. What message, John, is it going to send to Hamas that the day after that the Americans separate these two issues and say, you know what, you can have a ceasefire without a hostage negotiations, and then the United States is presenting its proposal how we should not go into Rafah. That's a real big problem, and that's why the prime minister made the right to decision uh, made the right decision to stop the delegation, which I was leading, uh, to go to Washington. Okay, so this trip was suspended. Is there any plans for you to come to Washington then in the future? I don't know. We'll have to discuss it with the U.S. administration. We haven't had those discussions yet. <clears throat> I think the context here was particularly problematic. Obviously, the U.S. has ideas, uh, and I'm sure they'll share it with us. I don't know if it'll be in a delegation in Washington's people coming here, us speaking uh, over the phone, but they have ideas that they want to present to us. The president asked the prime minister of Israel uh, to send the delegation so that they can, we can hear their ideas. We have our defense minister uh, in Washington now. I'm sure he's discussing this with them. But I think the timing was particularly problematic because of the message that this UN Security Council resolution was sending. It was a very, very bad message, both for the hostage negotiations, and also we have to be very clear with Hamas. We have to be very clear that we're gonna fight this war until the end. And the last thing we want them to believe that the international pressure on Israel will get us to simply not finish the war. That's not gonna happen. Now, I don't, I don't uh, decide what the United States will do or won't do. They're a sovereign government. They'll have to make their own decisions. But Israel has to make clear to Hamas that we intend to fight this fight till the very end. And hopefully that pressure, their understanding that we're going to fight this to the end, will enable us to get to a hostage deal. Well, the Israeli defense minister, as you say, is in Washington. We have Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, approving a Rafa operation. But the Israeli defense minister said he had a good meeting with officials in Washington. Did anyone convince anyone on either side to change? 
Well, look, we've been in discussions with the U.S. administration for a long time. The, the initial U.S. policy was essentially not that they're against an operation in Rafah full stop. What they said initially was that Israel has to uh, make efforts to get the civilians out of harm's way and to ensure that humanitarian assistance can get to them. And guess what? We agree. And we've been working on a plan to get the civilians out of harm's way and to get ramp up humanitarian assistance to them. So this is something where the two governments should be able to get to common ground and should be able to get on the same page. Now, if the position of the United States is there should not be a major military operation in Gaza, then we're not going to be on the same page because we have to go in to uh, Rafah. Uh, we have to finish the job. We have to take care of these four battalions. We can't leave 20 leave 20 percent or 25 percent of the Hamas force in Gaza so they can simply reorganize and come back. And Israel's major military operations actually have enabled us to do much smaller operations and achieve great success. Look at what happened in Shifa Hospital. I don't know if you're following that in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. We were there a few months ago and we did a major operation. Just now we went back last week. And we have done one of the most successful operations in Shifa Hospital in our history. Nearly 200 terrorists were killed there. Over 800 terrorists were captured. And there have been zero civilian casualties. In fact, there have been more Israeli soldiers, too, who have died in that operation than civilian ca casualties. Why can we do that? And I think this is a very important point for your viewers to understand. Because once you do the major military operations, once you crush these battalions and defeat them, Israel has to come in with a much smaller force, much more careful uh, military operations and achieve great success. Ron, That's why it's so important for us to go to Rafah and to finish the job. You keep saying fight this until the end. People have already talked about when you have people living in dire situations, people who've seen their loved ones being killed, that breeds extreme, uh, extremist type of behavior. And you're already seeing that in certain places, that even if you kill Hamas, something else will come in its place because there isn't leadership and there isn't a sense of what the future is. How do you counter those types of discussions? How do you say there is an end that you have in sight? Well, first of all, understand what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to destroy Hamas's military in, in Gaza. They're not a terror organization in Gaza. They're a military terror organization in Gaza. And we have to crush their military, and it's divided up into battalions. And we're doing that, I think, very well. But what you just said about it breeds extremism, I'd ask you, do you think that the action of the United States against the Nazis in Germany, do you think that bred extremism among Germans? Do you think the actions of the United States in Japan bred extremism. I mean, you were smart enough to, first of all, finish the job and win the war, and you demanded unconditional surrender to achieve it. And then you were smart enough to be magnanimous in victory and provide a different path for the future. Well, but you have to finish the job. If what you do not path? finish the job, the situation will actually be worse. There are... You have to finish the job, defeat them, and then you can talk about a day after. Then we can talk about how we can expand peace in the region, what we should do in the long-term prospects of Israelis and Palestinians. But there will be no day after Hamas if Hamas is still there. That's why we have to finish the job. I guess that one of the key questions that has been kind of hanging over this is we don't have a clear sense of how you provide that type of structure in any way when you don't have that being provided with respect to who's going to be the leader, with respect to who's going to provide the financing, with respect to even whether there'll be two states and what that will look like with a certain land in the West Bank being seized. So how do you address those kinds of questions that do need to be put into place before you finish the job? I don't believe they have to be put in place before you finish the job. In fact, I think just the opposite. I think if you try to put the, that in place now, you could actually undermine the effort to get to a real good day after plan afterwards. Because first, everybody has to understand that Hamas in Gaza is finished. Until they understand that, no one will step forward. So you're going to actually have a plan that's going to be stillborn. The second you win, that's the time when the international community, obviously led by the United States, Israel, Arab partners in the region have to come in and say, OK, what do we do now? Now Hamas is defeated in Gaza. What is the next step? To think that anyone is going to emerge now when you have four terrorist battalions of Hamas in Gaza, maybe around 15,000 terrorists fighting there, and that somebody is going to step forward kidding themselves. We saw what happened in the northern part of the Gaza Strip when we try to work with local actors. Hamas took them out and executed them. That's what's going to happen until we finish the job. That's why I think it is in the interest of all countries who not only are interested in Israel's security, but interested in a better future for the Palestinians, to get Israel to finish the job 
as quickly as possible so we can move on to a day after. And the truth is, we have real partners in the region for that day after. I think the Saudis are a partner. I think the Emiratis are a partner. I think they are starting, and they've worked to de-radicalize their own societies. I think we need to look for them and to their leadership to see what we can do in a day after. And then we can talk about all of those political issues. But first, we have to get to a day after. We have to finish the job. You cannot leave that force in Gaza. It would be like, as one Israeli minister uh, said, Minister Gantz, he said it would be like, uh, uh, fighting 80 percent of a fire, leaving 20 percent of the fire and simply hoping that it's not going to come back. Of course, it'll come back. We have to douse these flames and then we can talk about the day after. Minister, I know we only have a few minutes left with you. I had a few direct questions to work through with you, if I may. The vice president of the United States spoke over the weekend. Here's a quote from her. Any major military operation in Rafa would be a huge mistake. I'm not trying to understand from your side why you think that's not a mistake. I'm trying to understand now what the consequences would be if you cross that perceived red line now. Have they communicated what the consequences would be for Israel and the relationship between you and the United States? Have you heard anything whatsoever? No, uh, uh, they haven't communicated that with us. But I can tell you, John, what the consequences will be if we don't go in and finish the job. It'll be that October 7th will happen again and again and again. Uh, people in the United States have to understand that the people of Israel see what happened on October 7th as an, extent, as an existential threat to the country. And I'll explain to you what I mean. It's not because I think Hamas can destroy the state of Israel. They cannot. But if we do not destroy the terror organization that did that on October 7th, if we do not take them out as a military organization in Gaza, then I truly believe that this country has no future because all the buzzards who are circling around Israel and are looking to see what's going to happen to Hamas after they perpetrated that attack. They have to understand that Hamas is a terror organization in Gaza as a military is finished. You know, there are American officials. This happened a couple months ago. A senior official came and he said, you know, Hamas is an idea and you can't destroy an idea. And I countered by saying, you know, Nazism is an idea. And there are Nazis in Charlottesville walking around with tiki torches that they bought at Bed Bath & Beyond but they don't have a state called Germany. ISIS is an idea. And there are people who follow ISIS. You saw the attack in Moscow just a, a few days ago. And there are black flags that are in bedrooms, probably not just in the Middle East, but in Europe and even places in the United States. But they don't have a state. They don't control the territory of a caliphate between Iraq and Syria. It is one thing to deal with a terror organization. Is it another? It's another thing to deal with a military that is a terror group. That's a total different story, and we're going to dismantle Hamas's military regime in Gaza. It's going to happen. And I, I would like to have the United States by our, by our side. They've been there for the last five months, five and a half months, with critical support out of the gate. The moral clarity of the president calling uh, a Hamas sheer evil worse than ISIS. The fact that they sent aircraft carriers here. The fact that the president himself visited 10 days into the war when we could have had an escalation uh, in the northern part uh, with Hezbollah. So he, they've done very important things. And what I would and what I have implored them is to stand with Israel until the end, because we're going to achieve this victory. And I think it's not only in Israel's interest to achieve that victory, I think it's in America's interest to achieve that victory because they've been part of this through the pro they've been part of this victory up until now and now we're down the home stretch. I think stand with us, let us finish the job and let's get to a day after where we can actually have a real peace process that can give hope not just to Israelis but also to Palestinians.